Are you a diver and you maybe even take photos or videos underwater? Then this live stream is for you. Because we believe that everyone who takes images underwater is already an ocean ambassador. And to make sure that you can do your job properly and inspire people out there to care for the ocean and eventually protect it, we collected your questions beforehand on social media and we're going to ask those questions to creative professionals from the industry. And we are sending live from the world's largest water sports show here in Düsseldorf, the boat show, which is taking place from 18th to 26th of January. You're going to find us live in Hall 11 at the Pixel World workshop stage. Make sure you follow us on social media, on the Behind the Mask Facebook page and on the Behind the Mask YouTube channel. Turn on your notifications and most importantly, ask your questions down in the comments and maybe we will even be able to pick up your question and forward your question to our guest. And one more thing, by leaving us a comment, you already have a chance to win amazing prizes. The last live stream for today, 3.30 from the boat show in Germany, yep. Düsseldorf, with a very special guest that almost uh, made Hamdan have an, had a heart attack last time before we met him, yep. Fred Boyle. <laughs> I think we should uh, welcome him first. We don't need to talk about that. We don't need to talk about it? No. Why not? We have important things to be talking about today. No, I think it's very important to humanize you and Fred a little bit. I don't know. <laughs> I remember when we first went there, Hamdan told me, are we going to the resource and meet the grumpy guy? You know, Who lives uh, in the mountain? <laughs> you know, every time I see him, I think he doesn't like me. <laughs> is that like, yeah, you know how it is with the celebrities that you know from television and doing all the cool scientific things with sharks and everything, you know, they can be a little bit grumpy, but deep in their heart, they're really, really nice. So don't worry when you see him, he'll probably shout a little bit at you, shake you around or whatever. And before we went there, I also uh, told Fred that we tra tried to play the trick on Hamdan, so he tried his best to be very rude. It didn't, it didn't work at all. I, I remember you're standing outside your beautiful bungalow there in Fayal trying to scare Hamdan, and all of a sudden, it, nah, after two minutes, everybody was like best friends. But you know. It clearly worked. I had multiple heart attacks on the way there. <laughs> yeah. No. Welcome, Fred. Thank you for the welcome. We, uh, <laughs> we talk about the things that you've been sending us, what you've been doing recently. There's a few very interesting things, pictures. We throw in a few questions from uh, the audience. Um, but what, like, you know, when we met you there, you know, on your little house on the foot of the volcano in Fayal, and we were all very impressed that you can actually lead this kind of lifestyle. Yeah. You, you always read it in, in, I know you don't like it, in like, like yoga books and things like that, how people can be <laughs> super totally fine and in tune with their surrounding and everything. Like, I just wanted to, say you that, to tell you that like, personally, uh, again one time, the time that we had together in the Azores was really inspiring for all of us. Yeah, and we could like, really sure. learn how you do your things there. But I ask you one day, what are you doing here? You know, you said you, well, I go spearfishing. I complain when I have too much fish, so I have to freeze it. And then I eat it and I cook it, I go to bed. I do, like, really, what, like, the scientific things you do, what would you say is, like, the thing about you, what you do in your work? Well, basically, I just try to live my life uh, in the most yeah, natural see what way. I mean? yeah. Yeah. No, but really, you know, I, I wake up in the morning. If there's not too much wind, I go uh, free diving. I take my boat. I try to find animals to photograph. Uh, if there's nothing to photograph, uh, maybe I take a fish uh, for dinner. And if there's too much wind, I take my sailboat, go sailing. And if there's way too much wind and I cannot sail, maybe I take the bicycle. And uh, yeah, normal life. Some virtual normal reality life. things. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Some yeah, yeah, yeah not yeah. not really important. Like you to know, in my that. house, it's forbidden to use Spotify and Netflix and all this shit because I care about the environment. So yeah, I'm not spending my life on the internet, and uh, I try to discourage people yeah. to spend their life on the internet. Uh, well, except for this Facebook Live, huh? yeah, of course. Of course. Uh, yeah. huge, uh, yeah, you made yeah, an yeah, exception yeah. just yeah. for us. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of funny. Like no, but you know, just try to have a normal life uh, according to my environment and what I like to do. And, uh, you live in the Azores by choice. Yes. I arrived there um, 
the first time I arrived there was in 2009, because I had friends, um, a couple, uh, they were in the uh, Portuguese freediving team. I knew them from my old days of competing in the 2000s. And they always tell me, ah, you have to come to Fayal, visit us. And I never had the time. And in uh, 2009, I had one week. I called them, I said, ah, I have one week, can I come? Yeah. So I arrived there. And after three days, I bought a piece of land. And uh, two years later, I was there. You know, if you're hesitating with all the major yeah. decisions in your life, <coughs> maybe consult uh, him. In, in life, you need <laughs> yeah. to take decisions. Uh, you, no decision is always bad. If you take a decision, it can be good or bad, but at least you take a decision. And we all take good and bad decisions. So the story is take a decision. What would you say is the unique thing about your source? Yeah, okay, come on. Oh, yeah. yeah, 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 we can relate to that. <laughs> Okay, what is the unique thing about the Azores? I mean, let's start a little bit with a few visual things that you're doing there. Blue shots. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, it's not only blue shots, but um, I think it's one of the only remaining pristine spots in Europe, uh, which is a bit away of um, mass tourism. Uh, it's very natural islands. Uh, they were colonized very late uh, because there's all the... Um, uh, trade winds, the main currents don't lead there, so there was no human population until 500 years ago. It was colonized very late by Flemish people. <laughs> so <laughs> maybe ancestors, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, uh, maybe there's yeah. a connection there. <laughs> He's originally from Belgium. Yeah, yeah. and uh, yeah, shit happens. <laughs> and then, uh, so that's why I really like it. It's very natural. The people are very welcoming, as you could see. Um, yeah, and you live a life that's really close to nature, then um, it's probably one of the only places in Europe where you can live close to nature with a decent climate. Of course, you can go in the Orkneys in Scotland or something like that, but it's more hostile. Uh, so I think the Azor is a very good compromise for that. Yeah, I remember. We had a coffee and a water, three people, and paid 60 cents for yeah. everything, just around your house. Oh, for yeah, yeah but that's the normal price. Three the parties. problem is that what we pay here on the mainland in big cities uh, we think it's the normal price, but it's not the normal price. The no. normal price is 70 cents for a coffee. We should put that in perspective. Yeah, no, I totally yeah. agree. And uh, yeah, um, <clears throat> the photography you do, what is the mindset? The, oh, before we see a few of the examples and dive into you know, the different things that you've been done, what is the basic mindset behind it? Because I, I always have the feeling the things you do they're really, like everything is kind of really authentic. Like the free diving, you do the free diving, you know, and how you do your photography, natural light photography and everything. Like what is your mindset and philosophy behind your creative work? Uh, let's start from the beginning, how I got into underwater photography. In fact, um, my life, I've been high level athlete for 10 years. I was competing as a free diver from 95 to 2004. Uh, that was the golden age of free diving. We had sponsorship, competition were very mediatic, it was a very nice era. And in 2002, two years before I stopped competing, I bought my first underwater camera. The idea was to take pictures of and memories of the competitions. And also, in, back in the days during the competition, we were just free diving for pleasure. We were not just, you know, diving along a line and yeah. eating granola and stuff like that. We had a real life. <laughs> and so, the idea was to pick up that lifestyle and then show it first to the friends and but very quickly magazines started to be interested in that in those pictures because so far all the pictures of free divers were taken by scuba divers and it's a very different perspective a scuba diver has a much narrower uh, point of view on things which is not a bad thing eh? I'm not saying that but it's a very different way of looking at things and so I think that's why this picture people like them and of course I wanted to show the, the, the underwater world in its most natural way. So for that, it's wide angle and natural light. And so I started with that and I stick to that. So I've never used a macro lens, I've never used lights. I don't use lights because I think it's really bad for the animals. That's my real, what I really believe. And then, uh, so I stick to that. So I've never had anything else than a wide angle and uh, small housing and um, that's all. So that's the, for the philosophy. And about the look of the images, I don't know, I'm, I'm from an um, artistic background. I mean, in my family on my father's side, my grand-grandfather was a photographer before uh, 1900. 
He was one of the pioneers. Then uh, my grandfather was a painter, an uh, expressionist painter. My father was an uh, advertising and fashion photographer in the 50s and 60s. But he had stopped photography before I was born, so he never told me photography. He didn't want to see a camera uh, the, the, for the 40 years I knew him. So uh, alone by myself, and I think my eye was trained by what I was seeing at home, the painting, the art collection and things, and what I wanted to see in pictures. Because in the magazine I, would, I could never see a uh, picture of what we see on the water, this big landscape, wide, and with a lot of negative space. How do you, how do you manage, <clears throat> like we, we spoke with a lot of uh, guests mm. about the one topic and then just trying to ask everybody who is in the same uh, situation and position about it. Do you have the feeling that the camera disconnects you from like really experiencing the moment that you are in when you are photographing? Um, yes, of course, and sometimes uh, if I really want to enjoy something, I don't take the camera. Uh, like, for example, when I went to Antarctica six or seven years ago, uh, we took a small sailboat like you guys did, and uh, we went free diving there. Uh, I think for the first five days, I didn't touch my camera because there were so many things to see, information, new stuff. Camera was in, in the boat. I was diving without camera. I was not taking a picture uh, because I wanted to enjoy that. And after I took the camera, and uh, like in Azores on my boat, I always have the camera in the boat, but most of the time I don't jump in the water with the camera. Uh, because I think sometimes you need to reconnect to the sea without a camera uh, to be able to feel it uh, better, because I think it's distracting you. Yeah. So not having a camera will benefit the process when you have a camera? Okay. I think there's okay. a connection between that. Okay, so we already heard the story how you basically made your home uh, in the Azores. Um, we were fortunate enough to be disturbing you a little bit uh, in yeah, your house and messing up your living room. But remember, I let house. you first for one week in an hotel to check you if it was possible to uh, yeah, be okay. Yeah, and then I told you, okay, you can come to the house. Yeah, exactly. And it was a big Because mess. when these guys arrive to your house, it's, you have no idea about the equipment. <laughs> I don't know if you still have these pictures of yeah, my living room. Yeah, we trashed his room. house. Yeah, no, 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 we don't yeah, have yeah, these pictures yeah. anymore. <laughs> yeah, okay. We uh, had to delete them, obviously. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, no, but we were working on a little project together and, you know, we were basically kind of free uh, moving on to this uh, idea to do something together. We work on a long-term project uh, about human-animal uh, uh, interaction, which is uh, still in progress, but we had to finish one thing and, I mean, of course, it was not something that we really planned to do, but <clears throat> the film is called Carry Me Home. And it's basically somehow uh, a little bit of a portrait of Fred being at home in the Azores and how you would imagine he is talking to the planet about his last uh, <laughs> days. Yeah. Maybe in his fantasy he would like to jump in a submarine and being picked up and just like having his home in the ocean. Let's have a look at it and then we speak a little bit about Vladimir and all the other things that recently been happening in his life. Giving me home when the light in my eyes does fade. Giving me home when the shadow comes to take me away. Yeah, yeah, laying on my bones. Now when I'll be in a better place, release my soul. Carry me home. Carry me home. 
I'll be in a better place Release my soul It's a really cool submarine. Huh? It's, a really, yeah. it's, it's really cool, huh? Of the chance, uh, we have friends over there. We have a small foundation, and they have a, a submarine that can go to 1,000 meters. And uh, on the same year, I had the chance to do a dive with them to 1,000 meters it was totally uh, amazing, amazing. I think some of the Blue Planet things were also yes, shot yeah. with the submarine, the right? The sequence with the big giant six-gill shark eating the dead whale was taken mm -hmm. there with that submarine. Uh, in the Azores. Yeah, 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 yeah. What is your relationship with the blue sharks? How would you describe their mm. personality? Well, I really like these blue sharks because uh, it's a very nice species to interact with. Um, because it's very shallow, it's from zero to five or ten meters, so everybody can have a good experience with them. Uh, they're oceanic sharks, so they're always curious when something happens at the surface. Uh, very gentle, uh, almost hypnotic, yeah, the way they look. And uh, you, you cannot get bored of these guys. Uh, so I really like them. I uh, always look forward to the summer uh, to find them. And now we, in fact, we start to dive a bit in winter with them to find them, to tag them with uh, the scientists. And they are there also in winter. Problem, the water is green and uh, it's cold. <laughs> really yeah. looking forward because we're going to be there together yes, this again. summer. There's also a few people <laughs> that had the chance to actually follow us. We do a Invading my island again. Yeah, <laughs> uh, we're also bringing even more people that, you know, yeah. going to annoy you. He's so you. excited about this. Uh, yeah. we're gonna I probably have to move to Corvo, uh, which is the most remote island of the Azores. Where there's no flights and anything, uh, maybe. Uh, no, 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 I think we got oh, By the way, you know, you, we might have a new island when you arrive. A new because uh, since uh, November we had four and a half thousand earthquake, uh, 30 kilometers uh, southwest of Fayal, just after Condor Bank, where we dove with the blue shots, and it seems there's something that's coming out. Oh. So we might have yeah. a new uh, 10 island uh, by the summer. I don't know, but maybe. Uh, interesting. interesting. Yeah. No, we're looking forward to bring a few guys from the community with us. Here we know how much you like it when you're around a lot of people that ask you a lot of questions, you he know, about it. how you do this and that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you guys. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so. What happened? Maybe uh, you saw that uh, in the media earlier in, nine, in uh, 2019, uh, around April, uh, that the beluga whale that uh, appeared in northern Norway. Uh, it was spotted first by a fisherman. The, the beluga was around his boat wearing a kind of harness and uh, really like following the fishing boat. So the, the guy jumped in, took him one hour to get confident with the whale and finally could cut the harness. On the harness there was some Russian inscriptions. So there's a lot of theories about that whale. It's coming from Russia for sure. So we don't know if it was escaped from a um, uh, marine park, or maybe a military facility. Nobody knows exactly. And uh, so it was a very interesting story because it stayed in northern Norway all summer. Uh, and then a lot of people took pictures of it yeah. and videos. We've seen that on social media, a lot of articles. Uh, very, I think it's a very uh, contemporary story about animals and how we can screw up the the whole thing, uh, because he was captive, he was released or escaped, but somehow that animal has been around humans, he's been trained, because in our team, when we went there to look for him, uh, we had a former uh, seawall trainer uh, to assess, and uh, she was saying he was responding to uh, signs and oh, wow. orders and everything, so he's been trained. But he functioned very well in the wilderness, he's able to feed himself properly, you see he's totally okay with the nature uh, so it's kind of in between two worlds uh, 
So we wanted to find him and see what was about him. So uh, we went for three, four weeks in Norway and uh, we had some ideas where he could be. And uh, after 10 days, we found him in the, in the fjord. <coughs> but imagine it's not easy to find an animal yeah. like that. Uh, in Norway, you have five hours yeah. of daylight, it's very cold, a lot of miles with Zodiac to find him. And when we found him, we started to interact and uh, we found an amazing animal. Uh, very gentle, uh, really looking for uh, human contact. Because of course these animals are highly social, they need a pod, they need uh, fellows around them. And if they cannot have other belugas, they will yeah. be looking for human contact. So uh, it's, it's a nice story somehow, but it's very sad also. So the idea behind our trip was to see what could be done for that animal uh, and see maybe if it could be relocated. And uh, of course, when something like that happens, uh, you have the nice side of humans arriving, like, you know, you want to interact, try to see what you can do with an animal. You could see he was looking for, for contact. It was very moving. Every time we were leaving, it was like, you could see he was sad, like we were. You oh. can get into a relationship with that animal. And of course, it's getting political at some point because you have people saying, ah, you cannot do that. Yes, you can. No, you can uh, for the right or the wrong reasons. Uh, jealousies, you know, it's, it's always. And of course, with social media nowadays, you reach more people more quickly. So, you know, it's always it's bringing the good side and the bad side of humans all the time. And there's no black and white, of course. Uh, for some people, you're on the right side. Some people are on the right side. Yeah. It's always the same yeah. shit. Like with sharks, uh, you know, Guadalupe, the last thing with the when they kill the shark and all yeah, these yeah. things. Uh, so, yeah, it's a very interesting, very interesting story. If uh, what Fred is saying connects with you, then follow him on Facebook and uh, Instagram. We usually don't say that, but I particularly enjoy your posts because it's not only a photograph or a video or anything. There's, There's always a, a very straightforward opinion uh, on it, uh, whether you agree or not. It definitely triggers your your thoughts, so that might be a good idea um, to follow uh, him about it. Um, I, I also been following the, you know, the story a little bit, um, <clears throat> what was going on. What is actually, uh, is there anything that came out of it? Like, is there any conclusions? Is there anything, you know, that you take away from, from the whole expedition and the whole thing that went on there? Mm, on our side, I mean, it we just wanted to assess the, the thing. We had people with us ready to fund uh, something to relocate him. If local people could get together in the right way and not fighting each other and you know, trying to get the Why the thing would you have them. to relocate him? Because they're really highly social animals. And the problem in northern Norway, you don't, I mean, in Norway, Norwegian coast, you don't have belugas. So uh, they live uh, much more yeah. north. And uh, so he's alone. There's only uh, ah, so the idea is four poses. Yeah, maybe to bring him to another, another pod, pod or yeah. something. Because alone like that, he will die. One way or another. A fisherman, pissed off fisherman will shoot him uh, because he's going near the fish. Uh, a boat will hit him, hurt him badly. Maybe killer whales. You never know. Um, and that's why he's looking for human contact. You know, all these, what we call ambassador cetacean, like sometimes you have bottlenose dolphins, like in Ireland or Brittany, they're looking for human contact. It's because they are away from their pods. And eventually it can lead to problems. You know, this dolphin in Ireland or Brittany, there, there was some accident, not like bad accident, but people getting hurt, bitten, uh, yeah. broken ribs or broken, broken arms by a, a tail flap because they get pissed off. Uh, it's like a human, you know, who's in prison or who has too much freedom, no human, no social life. So it's, it's a very complex thing. And beyond the thing, okay, what do you do? You want to relocate? What do you want to do? We, do we want to solve that situation? It's more a relationship with wilderness that we should question. Uh, and also uh, the question to go diving with these animals, yes or no? Because we say, okay, it's good, we put exposure to the wilderness, but at the end, when you see the situation, so many people, because, for example, uh, you know, I live in Azores, I have no problem to say uh, there's way too much whale watching. 
Uh, you know, I, I love doing stuff with sperm oils, but every time I need to do stuff with sperm oils, I don't do it in azoles because it's so crowded with whale watching, we cannot do anything. The animals don't interact. And like, for example, at the moment, Norway with the killer whale, the situation is totally crazy. Uh, you have uh, 50 people in the water with no fucking clue what they're doing, and one day someone will get hurt. Um, so it's always the thing, okay, we go in the water, but where we draw a line? And it seems we're not able to draw a line. And that's, that's always, you know... Um, so it's all about the community and how we see these things and what can we do or not do and how we redefine our travels and yeah, it's a very complex thing. Do you have any idea if you would call the shot what you would do for example with the situation in Norway right now? I know there's a lot of uh, things underway to restrict or to organize uh, yeah. things a little bit better. I think you need at some point you need to, yeah. to take uh, measures because for the animals sure and because uh, you disturb the feeding pattern at some point um, of course, in a way, a lot of airing, you, maybe you don't disturb it that much, but at some point you might. Uh, same with some sharks, uh, shark dive in, uh, in some location. You know, I've been a lot in Guadalupe working there for more than 10 years, and I've seen the situation changing, the behavior of sharks, and, and, and then the la latest accident they had there, they, they killed another shark. And uh, there's like 10 boats going there now trips after trips yeah. after trips so we have to question ourselves and it's always to do the same thing to take the same shot so is it needed that everyone who's diving needs to go there to take the same shot that's you know i don't say it's good or bad but we have to question ourselves deep inside ourselves if it's worse to cross half the planet to go three days somewhere to get a shot and come back home uh in the days we have with climate change and everything you know, it's it's a big question mm -hmm. Let's throw in a very practical and simple question from the community. How do you manage with the buoyancy of your camera, free diving? We talk about free diving, photography. Ah, yeah. uh, you brought your camera yeah. here. But Obviously, there's no free much diving. To it. Usually, you know, it's just an housing, uh, a port. Uh, it's light. Uh, usually, it's neutral or a bit negative, just a bit negative. I prefer it to be a bit negative, so it's more stable. But, uh, I mean, uh, the, the problem, I think, comes when you have big strobes and lights because it's more difficult to, um, to balance. But uh, I have sometimes housings, depending on the port and what I have in the housing, the lens, sometimes it's a bit negative going to the front, going to the back. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't like to have too much buoyancy in the front uh, because you have a tendency to do that. When you shoot stills, it's okay, but with video, you, you move. How do you do that? How do you change the, you know, the buoyancy of the of the housing? If it's uh, with my up? hands. With your hands. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you don't. You <laughs> no. Oh. Just, no, 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 but no. I mean, you don't put any small weights on it. No, 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 I, no. I hate ah, equipment. No, 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 no. But no. really, usually I don't like equipment, so I like something that works. Uh, but then I'm not trimming. You know, I've never been. You know, trying to have the best yeah. suit, the best thing. It works. It works. Um, but you need something you're comfortable with and uh, that you trust you know that's you don't need to check all the time and you know when it's closed it's done it's in you have a good battery good memory card and like when i'm on a trip usually i don't open the camera every day i'm very conservative w when i'm shooting and sometimes uh, even on a big expedition i don't open the camera for 10 days or five days uh, i open when the battery is is that I open oh. it, change it. Uh, <coughs> because my take on it is the more you open, the more you close, the more chance you have to have a, a problem. Ah, okay. So, uh, yeah, that's what I do. Good advice. Yeah, just oh. a simple camera. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. What um, is this? So that was um, a cool expedition we did uh, for the Monaco Museum of Oceanography. And uh, it was in 2018. Uh, that's in the Salvagem Islands. That's a spot I always wanted to go. Uh, it's literally almost in the middle of the Atlantic. It's uh, small rocks that are between Madeira and the Canary Islands. And there's a very, very famous surfing spot there, but it's very difficult to get to. 
So we were there with a magnificent uh, oceanographic ship. We spent five, six days. And that was a 360 shoot, because we were doing 360 um, experience for the museum. And the wave is breaking on top. It's like the end of the day. It's a really powerful yeah. experience. Is this kind of stuff making the majority of your projects? Like Sorry. <clears throat> the majority of your projects, you have clients that like they seek you for your specific ability to either help tagging sharks, like white yeah. sharks or whatever, out of the in the normal environment to do that or to operate uh, cameras like this. Why would it be necessary to actually shoot stuff like that on freediving? Because I think with freediving, we are much more flexible. Uh, because when I was asked by the, the Monaco Museum, it's a series of exploration on the course of several years. And they asked me to be uh, head of the underwater imaging part of their exploration because as a free diver, I could put a team of very um, uh, of people that can be productive in any conditions. If we need, we you know, if someone can put a tank and, and do it. But in free diving, we can do 90% of the job. Uh, so I think they like that flexibility. And also for me, with my work as a photographer, when I started, you know, you always look for stories. And very quickly, the story is beside the freediving world, which is very boring, you know, uh, a world championship, it's the same picture, huh? going down, going up, <laughs> down, up, you do 100 athletes, uh, it's, it's nice, but it's boring. So I was looking for, for stories, and of course, very quickly, I started to work with scientists, because they do cool stuff. And uh, in 2005, I started to work uh, with a team of scientists that were tagging shark, I mean, hammerhead shark in the Eastern Pacific. Uh, so I arrived in Malpelo, I did four or five expeditions there, helping them. And quickly they, they say, ah, as a free diver, maybe you can help us to tag. And then that's how I got into shark tagging. And I saw their equipment was really bad because it was equipped for big scuba divers, very heavy stuff. So I started to modify spear guns and all that. And we started that trend of uh, uh, tagging shark using free diving, which is why well, it makes sense, it works. And, uh, and so that's how I got drawn into that scientific community. And I'm still working for them or for shark tagging or for taking picture of their work. And um, it's always making mm. nice stories. Is this and what we see here? Yeah, but that was yeah. not in the Eastern Pacific. That's in the, the Bahamas in Bimini yeah. uh, on a project to, to, with the Bimini Shark Lab uh, to tag some uh, great hammerheads. And here you see, I, I really like that picture. It took me a long time to get it because I wanted to have uh, a tag shark. You see the tag uh, we placed like a few hours before and with a receiver. And uh, it took me years to get a picture of the receiver mm -hmm. and the tag closed. How, how does that work? Does that, the receiver stay in the water all the yeah, time? Yeah, you have different yeah. type of tags. You have satellite tags that can track a migration, for example. And then you have the acoustic tag that's 90% of the tags we put because they're cheap, it's like 300 bucks and lasts for five but years. I and mean, so each tag <laughs> has a number, a code, and when it comes <coughs> to the vicinity of a receiver, it sends the code. And um, every time the scientists take the receiver yeah. and download the data, they can see the presence of the, the sharks. So it's very useful to know the local behavior of animals. And uh, there's so many animals with tags like that. Uh, and now there's a big network yeah. of receivers. So all over the world, we have receiver and tagged animals. Uh, but for example, a, a cool story. I mean, uh, it's not a cool story. It's a really bad story. Uh, during when we were doing that work, there was a, a very famous uh, underwater photographer uh, that was there at the same time. And he was saying, oh, what are you doing? I said, we helped the, the shark lab to tag sharks. And um, he said, oh. That's very bad. I say, oh, why? Ah, yeah, you shouldn't tag all these sharks because uh, these tags on the sharks look very bad for the pictures. <laughs> so uh, that's why I think, you know, in the underwater photographic community, we should really clean our acts and, you know, mm -hmm. try to see what's good or not. And uh, during that trip, we had two tags that were pulled out of the animals. So we cannot prove, it. of course, who did it, but uh, it was really bad to see that. I mean, it's a lot of effort, it's a lot of money to put these things, to, this expedition together, and then, you know, just because it doesn't look good on picture, people pulling the tags. Sorry, no, but 
And it's true though, because okay. these are the exact receivers. It used to be my job to download the data, like yeah. free dive down, and we saw multiple examples from the hammerheads where people would rip the receivers out. You can tell by the damage of the yeah. body. Yeah. And what did you reveal about the uh, behavior, movement, swimming patterns of the hammerheads there? Do you know anything so of the results? So in Bimini, the main thing is that the whole diving industry has flourished because of these receivers, because now you can track where these hammerheads are going, so you know which areas they stay in, so they've protected certain areas, and you learn more about the hammerheads. This is one of the only places in the world, in Bimini, where they've actually understood the living habits of great hammerhead sharks, and it was because of these tags that we're able to learn about them. And in Malpelo, for example, uh, with the data we got, uh, we were able, because with the satellite tags, we could see that the pregnant female we tagged went straight from Malpelo to the, um, the coast of Colombia in the mangrove, and they could create marine preserve in the mangrove yeah. where the, the exactly. scallop tamarind were giving birth. And Malpelo could be uh, classified as a world UNESCO heritage site thanks to this data. And the work we did in the uh, Revilla Higuero in Mexico, uh, with the connected movement of the amid between the islands, they could um, extend the protection area to all the, the water corridor between the islands and s instead of just protecting yeah. the islands. So this scientific work is very useful uh, to implement conservation measures. It's practical science. Yeah. It's not only knowing yeah. about you know, things mm -hmm. that nobody cares about except the scientists, but it really creates awareness and puts conservation measures together. Oh, yeah. What about these guys? Same thing? <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's uh, some uh, side picture during tagging expedition in uh, Guadalupe Island, Mexico. Started to work there in 2009. And uh, yeah, very special place, of course. Best place in the world for, for white yeah. sharks. A lot of sharks. Um, back in the days, there was not as many boats. It was more quiet. Sharks were more quiet. Uh, so always a nice place to go back. Two and they are absolutely magnificent animals. Um, of course, it's a big wild animal, eh? so you have always have to be careful, yeah. even with a reef shark. But uh, yeah, really nice memories and, and, and beautiful uh, creatures. Yeah, really I like mean, them. I imagine when you, <coughs> yeah, like you, the one tagging the white shark in the blue. Mm -hmm. Is there, uh, I don't know, I mean, they might be super friendly, but if somebody comes to me and... Well, actually, when tagging sharks, I never had any bad experience because basically, you know, you arrive, you shoot your tag, and the animal takes off. Yeah. You know, it's like you, if I go in the street, uh, punch you with a needle, you won't turn around and bite me. You will just <laughs> run away, you know? So we never had any, yeah, <laughs> we never had any <laughs> bad experience while <laughs> tagging. Yeah. Uh, but of course, yeah, you have to, to be careful. But the funny thing, I remember the first time I got uh, with a white shark in the water was way before Guadalupe in South Africa, in 2007, I think. And uh, we had been looking for white shark for the whole day and we couldn't find him. So we were baiting, nothing happens. Then we jump in, we started to move fish, cut fish and shooting fish and nothing happened, no white shark. And after six hours, we saw a white mm -hmm. shark, the, the boat called us, we went and uh, we had a small bait on a boat. And so I got in the water with the, the person I was diving with. And uh, at the limit of the visibility, I could see that white shark. It was not a big shark, it was a like, three meter shark, so almost juvenile. And then he turned mm -hmm. towards us and start to swim. And honestly, you know, for all my whole life, I wanted to be with a white shark in the water. You know, I, I was born in 72. So I grew up with the movie. I'm yeah. from the, like, the Joe's generation. So it's fascination, but also fear. And I saw that shark arriving. And then I say, what the fuck I am doing here? And suddenly <laughs> it was, oh shit. And then he was swimming towards me. I promise for two seconds, I had the uh, Joe's movie theme in my hand. Uh, ta -ta -ta -ta. And then, he came and really passed by me like one meter and I could see in his eyes that he was as curious but as afraid as I was. Well, not afraid but worried because the area where we were diving 
there's almost nobody going there. It's not a cage diving area or something. It's a very special place, and they don't see humans often. And so he was like, maybe we were the first humans he was seeing in the water. So it was very interesting to see that relation. And he stayed with us for 20 minutes, and then he went away. It was a great experience. I think it's the same experience Hamdan had when he met you for the first time. Yes, it would like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But just about this picture, it's from the scientific point of view, it's very important it's people like Fred who do the tagging because when you look at the body of the shark, I mean, you're inserting a huge tag, which can, you would think would be very painful. But if you're a freediver, you can steady your shot because you want to aim for the fin. The fin has the least amount of nervous pain Yeah, we, we, we shoot just under the, sh the exactly. fin in the muscle, yeah. which is a very thick muscle. Yeah. And the, the big advantage of freediving, in fact, because the scientist I was working there uh, with is Mauricio Hoyos, has been tagging shark forever. They do it from the boat, so it's very good to do it yeah. from the boat. But the, the advantage of freediving is that we can choose the animal. Exactly. Because sometimes he was asking us, okay, tag a large female, tag a young male, a juvenile male. So we can choose the animal and... Yeah it's more productive yeah. somehow but you for white sharks it's not absolutely necessary but it makes the work easier for him and to target the right the right shark yeah. Yeah. and for the scallop hammerhead because they cannot fish them uh, because in like in Malpelo or some place like that there's a lot of species of sharks and the first that bite on the the rod are silkies or black tips but the hammerheads are very shy, so they cannot catch them easily with the fishing. So free diving to tag them is almost the only way. Okay. Interesting, interesting. Let's see if we have a question that we want to ask here real quick, because time is running super fast. Considering your limited time underwater, how can you best plan your shots when free diving? So that as soon as you get down, you can snap the shot. Well, hmm. well that's an interesting <coughs> question, but I think it's... Nowadays, I'm going to be grumpy again, huh? but I think nowadays everybody wants to have the right shot straight away. They buy a camera, they go in the water, they want everything because online, you know, you go to YouTube. You know, at, at the experience uh, in Guadalupe, for example, with, with clients um, in the cage, yeah, cage diving, and they were complaining because uh, they only saw like, I don't know, 10 shots on the same day and only three at the same time from the cage. And they were complaining about it because they saw one video on YouTube, there were six shark in the frame. Uh, so I think, you know, we have to be patient, take our time. And freediving photography is the same. You need to be a good freediver, then you start yeah. to take your shots. And if you're a good freediver, you know the animal behavior and you know about your camera, that question doesn't exist. So it's always the thing. Follow what you need to do. It's a long-term thing. You need to polish your skills. First, become a good freediver, then a good photographer, know a lot about animals, and, and then things happen naturally. I don't think about that. Uh, and usually, if you see my dive profile, I shouldn't say that, but <laughs> most of my dive, it's 20, 30 seconds, maybe at seven or eight meters. You know, I don't go to 60 meters or 40 meters to take pictures. It's just because I know the animal, that I know if a shark comes, that species of shark, in that area, he will do that pattern. So I just go there and I wait he comes. I, I go before him and it's a 20, 25 second process. But because I learn about the animal and I know what he's doing, I observe before working. That's what we were saying at the beginning. I dive a lot without a camera just to understand the place. And then you take the camera and the shots are very easy. Efficient, smart, lazy, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The Fred I'm way. very lazy, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you also do so quite artistic things. Sometimes you send us the, this this one as well. What, yeah. What's behind this one? Well, I like that one because you know I love sailing. I do a lot of sailing, and uh, that's the um, the bottom part, the under part of a very famous uh, racing yacht called Pendwick Six. It's with that boat that uh, Eric Tabarly won the. Um, uh, transat, mm -hmm. transatlantic race in 1976 and it's been converted into um, uh, not a research vessel but uh, the daughter of Eric Tabali is taking it around the world uh, to organize uh, they, they do meetings they bring scientists thinkers uh, writers uh, to places and, and give the opportunity to use the platform to do research to do talks 
It's a very interesting project and they, they spent a month in Azores this, uh, during the summer. And uh, we had, uh, I mean, I spent a few days with an astronaut uh, that went uh, like three months in the space station. So we could exchange ideas. Um, they gave us the boat for six days to go offshore in Prince Alice with George, the scientist that worked there to tag the mobulas and the blue sharks. So it was a very nice project. And yeah, for me, it's a very famous boat. And uh, I like I like the bottom of that boat. It's just uh, it's a cool thing. Nice. Hamdan, <coughs> your turn. Yeah. No, from the live stream, I've just been looking at the questions. And I think everyone is very impressed <coughs> with the way that you think. It's a very different way from the rest of the, the rest of the world when it comes to the underwater world. So there's a lot of people asking for advice, but maybe if you can describe how you got into this and how you've made this a career, and if you could somehow relate that into giving advice okay. to people who are looking at it as well. But when I started underwater photography, the market was much easier. Uh, from the moment I started to now, I would say the price magazine pay images has been divided by 10 almost. I remember uh, in yeah, 2002, 2005, uh, I don't know, a, a mainstream magazine, because I've always been trying to target mainstream magazine, not diving magazine, because there's no money to be made there. So the stories were more targeted for the wider audience magazine. For example, in France, uh, a big mainstream magazine was paying a full page around 3,000 euros. Now, if you get three or 400, you're lucky. So basically, you cannot live out of that. Uh, it's uh, it's yeah. an added revenue, so your business model had to change. At the beginning, I was part of my revenue was bigger in the photography. Now it switched. So now I do more uh, documentary filming, um, you know, all this kind of work. And, but the most important, I think, is try to have your niche, your speciality. If you do everything, you know, if you do wide angle, macro, blah, 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 everything, video at the same time, you cannot focus. And I think the key is to focus on one thing you can do well. And I'm sure everybody here with an underwater camera has something he can do very well and just stick to that, don't do anything else. That's my advice because it worked for me. But maybe there's other photographers that are able, I know a few guys that are able to do all around, yeah. but yeah, also they have a niche market, they know they have the right connection, so, but never be grumpy because the market changes. I heard, I, I've heard a lot of photographers, older photographers, you know, bitching and moaning about the fact the market changed and that, you know, now the, the market is dead and always grumpy. But all the time you are grumpy complaining about something, you don't try to find new ways. Yeah. So just focus on the future and the new ways and don't be grumpy about the old past. You know, it was always better in the yeah, old days. Yeah. Yeah. Just be grumpy because you <laughs> like it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right? <laughs> Good. Hamdan, anything else? Yeah, the other question was, it's a more of a philosophical one and it's something that we touched on earlier. How do you, in your eyes, what is the right balance between exposing more people to the likes of sharks or the beluga whale and crossing the line? Mm -hmm. In your opinion, where is the balance? You know, my, the thing, the, I think the key is to redefine your, your limits all the time and question yourself. Uh, I would say 10 years ago, uh, my take on it was to take as much people as you can with you to show them sharks and, and all the animals because then they become ambassador of it. But I think nowadays doing that is causing more harm. Yeah. So I stopped organizing trips uh, with wildlife back in 2013, I think, because at some point uh, it's black and white. You're part of the solution or part of the problem. And for me, you know, sometimes I, I still guide people, but I don't organize things. If someone comes in Azores, call me, I'm there. Okay, I will go with him. Uh, but I, I won't advertise for something and weeks yeah. of free diving with sharks or stuff. I think it's, for me, it doesn't work anymore. Uh, although there's a big market there, you can make a lot of money. But at the moment, I don't think it's, it's, it's fair enough anymore because there's so many so much pressure on, yeah. on animals. Yeah. Uh, but that's my personal take yeah, on it. It's good to hear that side of it as well, because it is a reality. But that changed, because before I was advertising for that. Like, mm -hmm. you know, aquariums also, uh, it's a big question, should be aquariums? Okay, it's good to bring children to aquariums. I was believing that until three, four years ago, and now mm -hmm. I think 
should go virtual and you know it's yeah it's done the thing is i think we forget we are in the 21st century for 20 years but we still behave like in the 20th century <laughs> but it's fucking 20 years we're in the 21st century mm -hmm. so let's think like 21st century thanks yeah thank you guys Thanks a lot. We still come by and uh, we expect to have a phone party at your house and we expect to steal your BMX bike. I have a new BMX coming. <laughs> Another one. Okay. A very big one. <laughs> good, good. But you do know that means we're going to die. No, like no, he will the, kill the us. The new big one you might be able to ride it. Oh, yeah, because it's not a collectible item. Oh, okay. Okay, good. Yeah. That's yeah. good to All know. Alright, <laughs> thanks for staying with us. If there's any questions, um, you can ask it now if you hold your hand up or you go to the live stream if there's anything now then leave it now otherwise just uh, comment under the live stream uh, and have an eye on the live stream if there's yeah, any questions yeah i will do that tonight at the hotel because now i don't have access no now you know, we have now a party, have the party in with us. Uh, one and a half hours <laughs> right here. the yeah. party starts <laughs> And uh, we're going to be busy with that. And tomorrow we have, you might know him, no? Guillaume Neri at 11 no, o'clock. Yeah. <laughs> Just kidding. And then at uh, 2 o'clock we will talk about how you probably fly your drone on dive trips. No. No. Theory. No. We're all going to be here. Great. So dress up, come over, get one of those wristbands just to look good. You don't need them to be here at the party. You know, have ah, a drink with us. More plastic. Great. No, 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 this is, uh, <laughs> it's not plastic, this is, uh, I think, some cotton, no, I'm kidding. cotton thing. Uh, That's what they say. And we have a photo booth over there, right? You can do your boomerang photo GIF or like a video or whatever and uh, spread it out into the world together for the ocean, together with you Good. guys and everybody else in the evening and tomorrow. <clears throat> we do our warm up in the morning, but then 11.15, uh, Guillaume will be here and we have a, we'll have a good time with him. Thanks a lot, and we are out for now. Thanks, Ed. That was a lot of fun. Thank you, guys. Yeah.